right, we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to this afternoon, well, afternoon for me, for this uh, pre-lunch session. Um, we're here for Sump Pumps, Racism, and Your Electricity Bill with Kate Mangoya, the Director of Capacity Building at Groundwork USA. She's going to be discussing Redlining's role in environmental injustice and what to do about it. So I'm just going to hand it over to Kate. Kate, take it away. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm, I'm so happy to get a chance to talk to you a little bit about Groundwork USA and the work that we're doing. Um, but first, a, a little bit about Groundwork USA and who we are. Groundwork USA is the national support organization for 21 people-centered environmental justice organizations across the country. We do a variety of work to help change the built environment and put residents in the driver's seat for creating the kind of communities they want to have. So we do everything from being the urban forester and helping to increase the density of urban tree canopies to uh, transforming brownfields into community assets like parks and trails and urban farms. And very recently, we've been moving in a little bit more intentionally into the climate mitigation space, how to make sure that folks are safer from heat and wet as, as that continues to get worse due to the climate crisis. Because we know that across the country and across the world, it's getting hot and getting really wet in here. The um, National Climate Assessment estimates that there's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars in lost productivity and in mortality from heat-related illness and from flooding. So we know that it's going to be expensive and deadly. We also know that the consequences of our changing climate are not being felt equally from state to state from city to city within a state and not even from neighborhood to neighborhood within the same city. And I'm here to tell you that that's not a coincidence. There's a really long history to it and we're gonna chat a little bit about that today. We were lucky enough at Groundwork USA to get the opportunity to ask a really cool question. Is there a relationship between historical uh, segregation, housing segregation processes, and we're using redlining as a proxy for that, and then modern day risk of the climate crisis, so specifically to extreme heat and to extreme flooding. So we've gathered together now nine cities. Each one of these cities has a trust in it. And I forgot to mention, um, hop on to groundworkusa.org and, and take a look to see if there's a groundwork trust in your community and I encourage you to check them out. But we've pulled together nine cities in our network to help answer this question and see what can we do about it. Um, hop on our website if you get a chance. There's really cool interactive maps, some of which I'll show you today um, that you can play around with if, if you're located in any of those cities that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, so redlining, just really quickly, in case you're not familiar with it or if you're rusty and it's been a while, I'm going to give you a redlining 101 to help catch you up for the rest of the conversation. Um, so we're all traveling back in time. It's the Great Depression. People are suffering. The federal government is looking for ways to help um, alleviate the burden that this economic crisis is causing on people. And we know that in our culture in the United States, one of the best ways to build wealth for yourself and to build intergenerational wealth for your family is through property ownership. But it's really expensive and can be really hard to buy a property outright. So a lot of folks seek mortgages. And the federal government created something called federally backed mortgages, which means that if a private lender let, uh, makes a loan to you as a borrower uh, and you fail to pay that loan, the federal government's going to be able to pick up the tab. It's a federally backed mortgage. If you own a home today, it's very likely that you are a beneficiary of this New Deal era program. So the federal government had to figure out which areas were going to be risky bets for them to back and which areas were going to be safe bets. So they created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which went to major American cities across the country and surveyed them to figure out which neighborhoods were risky, aka which neighborhoods had black and brown people in them, which neighborhoods had extremely low income people in them, which neighborhoods had poor quality housing stock. And they outlined those areas in red or redlined them those neighborhoods that had predominantly the right kind of white person. And I really encourage you to go take a look at the National Archives and uh, read the notes for these maps because you see the United States starting to wrestle with, gosh, how do we feel about the Polish? And you know, are the Quebecois and the, the France French, what, what kind of, do we consider them to be white and are they are the same degree of white? But those neighborhoods that were wealthy, good, had good housing stock and the right kind of white person, those were outlined in green. Um, and you might say, okay, cool, you're talking about um, this thing that happened in the 1930s. What does that have to do today? What does that have to do with land reuse? What does that have to do with the climate crisis? Um, well, if you were one of the families that was living or owned property in that, red line, in that area that was redlined, 
all of a sudden folks are not able to buy your property, which means that you are not able to get loans um, or, or, or capture the equity that you may have put into your property, which means it's going to be really hard for you to make improvements um, and you may be disincentivized to make the improvements. We also found that city governments uh, were less likely to make improvements in these uh, formerly redlined areas. And that's everything from choosing to not put parks in these areas with low property values uh, that had been redlined um, to not even upgrading uh, the sewage system to the same level as other areas and in, in other neighborhoods. So there were financial disincentives at the local level and um, from the government and from folks that were living in those properties. So if you lived in that neighborhood and you wanted to buy a property, you couldn't get a mortgage, so you can't buy. You wanted to sell, you can't really sell. No one can get a mortgage for your property, so you may have to accept much less for, for it. Um, and it may mean that you're stuck in that neighborhood. And just to be really clear, redlining did not cause the segregation um, that we see that, that's still alive and present today. It just codified um, pre-1917 uh, segregation from the days when cities would uh, more intentionally segregate their neighborhoods. Um, so I'm gonna show you a GIF on the next slide. And just as a quick reminder, green is uh, white, high quality housing stock, red, usually black folks, low quality housing stock. And this is gonna be of Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is just south of New York City and just south of the New York airport. And I want you to find an area that is outlined in green. And just keep your eye on that area. This is tree canopy cover as of 2016. This is impervious pavement, so think driveways, parking lots. And then this is relative heat. So the red areas. Now find a, a red outlined area. Again, tree canopy cover, impervious surface, and then relative heat with those red areas being the hottest. You're probably looking at this and saying, hey, I see some sort of a relationship, but I'm not totally sure. Don't worry, we pulled out our middle school bar charting for you and showed you the punchline to this, that as you go from areas that were formerly redlined um, those D areas, sorry, as you go from neighborhoods that have been formerly green lined, those A areas, to neighborhoods that have been formerly uh, redlined, you see that red bar, the land surface temperature goes up. You see impervious pavement, so again, driveways, parking lot, that gray bar goes up. And then my least favorite, but sort of most stunning, is that green bar, the tree canopy cover, something that can be really helpful in keeping neighborhoods cooler and safer from extreme weather. Um, and so today about 75% of those neighborhoods that had been graded D in the 1930s are still low to moderate income neighborhoods. And more than half of those neighborhoods that had been graded as, as degraded areas that had been redlined are still majority minority neighborhoods. So as James Baldwin once said, the past is not past. We're still living with the consequences in terms of land use uh, related to redlining and um, the impacts of the climate crisis. At this point, if you've studied things like the maternal mortality rate or the school to prison pipeline, um, you're pr probably disappointed by what I showed you, but you're not terribly surprised because we know that this legacy um, permeates a lot of aspects of our culture. So why would it not apply to the way that we use land and the way that we experience the climate crisis? Um, and you might say, well, Kate, now you've depressed me. What do you do about it? Well, one of the steps that we took when we uh, got these maps and, and uh, found this information was to overlay on our, on our nine cities a heat vulnerability index. And this heat vulnerability index looks at neighborhoods that are relatively hot compared to other areas, shades those in dark red, and then also evaluates where residents have the least amount of adaptive capacity to be able to deal with those high temperatures. So the number of people below the poverty line is what we use for that adaptive capacity. And think about that. If you are having a particularly hot summer, like we did here where I am in Boston, um, where in the month of July, we had 10 days over 90 degrees, it's gonna be really expensive for you to run your air conditioner. Our electricity bill was, was absolutely through the roof. So if you're a low-income family, that's gonna mean that, that you're not quite um, equipped to deal with that intense heat, or maybe it's gonna be more expensive for you to pay those doctor bills. Um, so we gathered together each one of our trusts and decided that, that what we wanted to do was to organize residents in these neighborhoods that had a history of race-based housing discrimination and are currently experiencing disproportionately severe um, heat, extreme heat and extreme wet, and organize them to learn about why their communities look this way, to explain to them our neighborhoods don't look like this by accident and they're not gonna change by accident. We then worked with residents to help them prioritize the types of mitigation measures they would like to see in their community and then we're building their capacity so that they can intervene in policy and planning systems 
things like master planning processes or uh, budgetary cycles to self-advocate for a more equitable distribution of resources to help them combat extreme wet and extreme heat. Um, and you might say, Kate, this is a really complicated thing to explain to residents on the fly. Uh, well, back in the before time, sort of before quarantine, um, we used kind of an interesting method of communicating this to, to residents. And that's overhead transparencies. And if any of you are old enough to remember, you know, in middle school when your math teacher was like, ah, algebra on the overhead projector, there are these clear acetate pieces of paper effectively or pieces of plastic. Well, we actually, on those uh, overhead transparencies, print out the different layers of the map and let residents build the story for themselves to say, hey, here's our city. This is the neighborhood your house is in. Go ahead and put this red lining map on top. Now let's put tree canopy cover on top of that. Now let's take impervious pavement and layer that. And so, so allowed residents to layer this for themselves and then guided a discussion about what they notice. What's, what's the history of their neighborhood? How do they remember this neighborhood 20 years ago as compared to today? Um, what are the assets that they find? What are the areas that, that need improvement or that they feel are missing or needed? Um, and what should the city do next and where should that happen? Where do we need to see green infrastructure put in? Where do we need to see trees? Where do we need to see uh, resident education around um, clearing sewer drains or, or more robust uh, city programs so that the city does it themselves? Um, a couple of examples of how we've, we've utilized this process um, to, to lead to the more equitable distribution of resources. One example I like is in Denver. Um, in Denver, Colorado, a couple of years ago, they passed a uh, ballot measure called Ballot 2A which creates a, a steady stream of funding for capital maintenance, backlog, and parks development projects that are given out on a five-year budgetary cycle. And so we worked with folks in the Globeville neighborhood. Um, and Globeville is a really interesting spot uh, in the sort of northern part of Denver on the west side of the river uh, that has a really long environmental justice history. It was a home to a lead smelting plant. Um, it was a super fun site. And when we got to, together with residents and the maps, we first started looking at tree canopy cover. And we've got some digital versions of these maps, not just the transparencies. And you can roll your cursor over our digital maps and find out more specific information. So residents found, hey, our neighborhood in Globeville has about a 1% tree canopy cover. But if you take um, the bus just across the river to a neighborhood that was green lined, it has about 24% tree canopy cover. That's a big deal in terms of water retention when you have heavy rains. That's a big deal when it comes to reducing the ambient air temperature and making it more comfortable around your house. And that makes a really big difference in terms of curb appeal. I don't know if any of you folks have, have walked down a major corridor in the, in, in the summer. If, there's not, if there aren't trees there, um, it can be pretty uncomfortable and pretty hot, especially with cars zooming by. So that helped residents to come up with their specific ask. Hey, Denver, we want 10,000 trees in 10 years, and we want a say in funding distribution. We want part of that ballot to a funding to be uh, given out in a participatory budgeting style so we can decide where the green infrastructure needs to be and we can decide how to improve our neighborhood. Um, another example, Richmond 300, or Richmond, Virginia is undergoing their master planning process um, and the residents were able to get together and say, hey, all of these neighborhoods that have a really high heat vulnerability index, so are relatively hot, compared to uh, other neighborhoods and have a lot of low income folks who are living there. Uh, we want those neighborhoods that have a high vulnerability index that happen that, that are in formerly red line neighborhoods uh, to be prioritized when the city is doing green infrastructure installation, tree canopy um, installation um, and, and water mitigation, flooding mitigation measures. Um, and that successfully made it into the, the latest draft of the Richmond 300 uh, planning process. We like all of you, got hit with a really big winter curveball. Um, everyone in our network, every one of the residents that we work with got hit with this triple threat. The climate crisis, it's happening. It's a little unpredictable, but generally we know things get hot, wet, dry, burning. Um, we had COVID-19 hit, and then of course the faltering economy that came out of that. And just like it's not a coincidence that neighborhoods that were formerly redlined uh, are hotter and wetter than their gr formerly green-lined counterparts, it's not a coincidence that those same neighborhoods are experiencing racial disparities in death rates and in rates of illness from COVID-19. Um, and then also in terms of uh, their economic security, in terms of losing frontline worker jobs. This is a map of, of Richmond, California, which is in the Northern Bay Area. Richmond never had um, redlining maps produced for it, but if you look through um, 
if you look through some research, you'll find that Richmond has a really long history of federally sanctioned housing segregation related to wartime uh, shipyard work and to uh, work in the, the local refineries. Um, and a lot of uh, people of color in Richmond were segregated to this area called the Iron Triangle, which you can see on the map. And that's stuck between the refineries and then also between rail yards, which move petrochemicals. Um, so this map shows uh, Richmond, California with the Iron Triangle area overlaid on it. Um, and then those uh, dark brown areas, that's a high asthma rate. If you are a community that's already suffering from disproportionately high um, asthma rates, you are going to likely be more vulnerable to the COVID-19 crisis. So th there's no accident that we're seeing all of these overlays and it's not gonna change by accident. So we need to be very intentional in talking about the issues and in talking about how to solve these issues. Uh, because the summer is are getting hotter and hotter. This summer was really tough in Boston. Usually we get, um, about 10 degrees above, uh, 10 degree, sorry, 10 days above 90 degrees across the whole summer. That was the case about 15 years ago. Now we saw that just in July. On average, you find a 4.5 degree Fahrenheit difference within um, neighborhoods that had been redlined to neighborhoods that were green lined. So it's about 4.5 degrees hotter on average in redlined neighborhoods today. Sometimes that can be as extreme as 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And I want you to really think about what that feels like, especially if you're living in a house that might not be able to run the air conditioner all the time. You wake up hot, you go walk maybe to the bus to take the bus to work, and you're doing that hot. You come home, it's still hot. You're going to bed, it's still hot. Um, and a lot of the mitigation measures that we use have the ability to cool the neighborhood, but it's gonna take a little while for them to kick in. I live in a formerly red line neighborhood, and about three years ago, the city planted these trees outside and they're beautiful. I'm so excited about them. They're the bomb. They're going to be awesome in 15 years when they finally grow to full size. But right now they're just casting this like tiny little sad anemic shadow and are doing nothing to change the land surface temperature or the ambient air temperature in my neighborhood. So, so these things that these mitigation measures are putting into place, they're helpful, but they're not going to be useful for a little while. And we know that our summer toolbox was kind of tough this year. A lot of cities didn't open their splash pads or close them early, even though there's really hot weather. Uh, we didn't want to put elderly or at-risk residents clustered together in cooling centers because of COVID-19. And then, of course, there is that uh, economic pressure. If you've lost your job, if you're on unemployment and you're struggling, that really high electricity bill from running an air conditioner is going to impact your family quite a bit. Uh, so at this point, I've probably bummed you out. I'm sorry, it's Thursday at 2.30 2 and I've depressed you, but I promise um, that I have some positive things to say next. Uh, yes, it's a really sad situation. It's disappointing. It's not surprising, but grassroots efforts can meet community need. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about it. But the first thing I want to say is a little bit of a caveat. There's no panacea. There's no 100% solution that is going to help solve things. At best, we're looking at a bunch of 1% of 0.001% solutions that can help us to mitigate uh, the climate crisis and help us to bring environmental justice and equitable development to the neighborhoods that, that were historically um, redlined. In the short term, our groundwork trusts are working on grassroots mitigation measures to just help people get through the summer and this fall. So things like swapping high energy efficiency air conditioners. Maybe there's a business that closed or that's not um, accepting customers in. Let's take that air conditioner and bring it to a family that needs it. Um, splash pads are closed. Let's get sprinklers into the hands of families. Uh, to training, um, youth who are 18 or over to do white roof painting to help reflect some of the sun off of the apartment buildings um, and to also build along major transportation corridors opportunities for people to sit and rest and cool themselves on covered benches and on bus shelters. So those are just some of the examples of, of things we're doing in the short term. Um, in the medium term, we really need to think about systems change, about encouraging uh, through policy, encouraging through budgetary cycles, um, the cities to take seriously the funding, building, and maintenance of green infrastructure and inviting residents to participate in each one of those and, and to benefit um, from, from the installation of each one of those. And then also to rethink some of our relief packages. There's a lot of cities that do things like offering cooling credits um, or offer um, relief credits for, say they have stormwater fees. What if we just reduce the amount of stormwater that's going into the system by helping uh, the, the city help residents install rainwater capture and a variety of other mechanisms to, to help deal with that, that overflow or cool neighborhoods so that folks don't have to use so much electricity to cool their apartments with air conditioning? And are there ways for us to, to have these, to do these installations and do these projects while keeping jobs and keeping money into the community? 
in the very, very long term, we need to think in the short, medium and long term, we need to think more about investing in communities. Uh, communities have members have to be in the driver's seat. They know what they need. They know what they want. Um, and they should be in the driver's seat. But all too often, they're not even allowed to get into the car when it comes to policymaking. And that's something that we're hoping to impact through our Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership. And so at this point, you're probably saying, cool story. That was moving. I feel inspired to plant some trees, green gardens. Um, check out the redlining maps of my own community on the National Archive site and see what my city is doing. Um, but what's the connection to land use and land recycling? I am at a land recycling com uh, conference. And for, what I wanted to say is just give you some examples of how we're using maps as a platform for conversations about equity and say that our use of maps are not just useful for mitigation measures, they're really useful for the work that you're doing right now. Um, people ask me all the time, they say, Kate, you know, the city, the residents, what do they ask you about in terms of the number of the number of tons of carbon that you're hoping to sequester or the ambient temperature that you're hoping to reduce? And the answer is, is that those uh, types of numbers don't come up that frequently. What people respond to when they're looking at our maps is that they're responding to the unfairness that they see. Why is it that the heat vulnerability index north of this river in Richmond, why is that um, higher than in other areas of the city? Why is the tree canopy cover so terrible in the eastern part of the, the state in Elizabeth, New Jersey, but really nice out in the western part? And why does that overlap exactly with where um, there are higher percentages of Hispanic residents in our city? There's a deep unfairness to that. So you can really move people to long-term participation by having them take a look at their city and, and understand what, what is in there that they want to change and what do they have the power to change by engaging in your process. Another thing, and I'm going to call out engineers for a minute, but I hope to really call you in on this, um, is demystifying maps. Groundwork USA also does a lot of work as a technical assistance provider to communities across the country that are helping to hoping to transform brownfield sites equitably into community assets. And I'm sure you folks, have, a lot of you folks have seen maps like this before that show hey, you know, we dug this well here, we found PFAS here, and this is the site that we're gonna cap. These are so unintelligible to residents that it's not um, super useful for conversation. So, so something that we do is help community groups that are interested in learning more about their brownfield site, translate them into to maps that are a little bit easier to place. This map, I have a good idea of where this sits along the river. I have a good idea of where um, this is in relation to my house. And then I can look at more specific things related to the brownfield site surrounding. Gosh, what's the heat vulnerability index here? Are there neighborhoods that are really vulnerable? Gosh, that overlaps with the brownfield site that we're talking about. Maybe we should really be talking about integrating some cooling measures into this area. Hmm, what's the relationship between my brownfield site and its proximity to parks? And then what is that relationship to areas uh, that have households that are living below the poverty line? So discussing the site surroundings and using clear, colorful, easy to interpret maps that you walk residents through really open up the conversation about what the site reuse can be and how you can use that site reuse to right the wrongs of the past, bring environmental, greater environmental justice to the neighborhood, and more equitably develop the site so that those who are around it, those that need that benefit most are experiencing that. And you might say, well, Kate, that's great, but I don't really know how to make maps. We don't have that in-house capacity. We're working on a shoestring budget to do this. Well, we're really lucky we actually have someone in our network that does make our maps. So I know that we're really privileged to have that. Uh, but I encourage you to partner with local universities. There's very likely a planning school near you and they all have to take intro to GIS. So harness that and see if you can get them to help um, make some of the maps that you're using in your community engagement processes um, a little bit more user friendly or to create them at all as platforms for discussion about equity in your community. Uh, before I wrap up, I also wanted to do a really, really quick plug that if you're interested in learning more about this or uh, broadly about equitable development and environmental justice, uh, maps, how to set environmental justice goals and, and communicate them effectively to your community, Groundwork USA does offer free for the next year from now until about September um, 30th of, of 2021 free equitable development and environmental justice technical assistance for communities uh, that are dealing with a brownfield parcel. So I'll leave this slide up for a second. Um, email my colleague Adi or you can email me Adi at groundworkusa.org or Kate with a C at groundworkusa.org um, and we would love to help you out. So, so please reach out to us if you're looking for a little bit of help taking these really big ideas and putting them into practice into your community. So that's it, I'll wrap it up. Hopefully I didn't go too over time. Hey, that's not bad. All right, um, so learn more, go to our website, groundworkusa.org. 
Um, and then please email me. I love to talk about this stuff and, and would love to chat with you about it. So I'll wrap up there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a really excellent talk. I just want to remind everyone uh, that you can submit questions through the Zoom chat. If you're using Whova, it's that orange, might be orange, blinky chat um, that you can use right there. Um, I do just uh, have a couple questions for you, Kate, but I, I want to get everybody else's questions addressed too, so make sure you utilize that Zoom sure. chat. So, um, Lori actually uh, queued me up for this one pretty well. So uh, how does using the transparencies in maps translate to multi-generational audiences? We have had so much success in using these transparencies to have uh, conversations with a variety of folks, we, we, it, not just in our Climate Safe Neighborhoods project, but also in our technical assistance for brownfields impacted communities. We find with some degree of frequency that elders in a community and younger working folks, so people with younger families and like the 18 to sort of 30 ish group, sometimes will have different visions of what they want their community to be. Um, you know, Flint is an example, Michigan is an example of where we've seen this, where, where older folks, um, you know, might be interested in bringing manufacturing jobs back to uh, back to a location and younger folks might say, hey, we want a diversified economy and some green spaces. Um, and we, we believe that maps are a really great opportunity to have conversations about what was, what's the history of that space, what do you remember, what do you really love about your city, what do you really love about this community, um, and about what that future could be. Is, is there a way to meet halfway about it? These are the deficits that we see. Um, and they just serve as a fantastic platform for conversations about equity. The other thing that, that I thought was, was kind of cool and was very surprising to me when we started to use these maps is that residents um, who maybe do not believe in institutional or structuralized racism, all of a sudden are able to approach multi multiple dimensions of equity in ways that they haven't been able to without looking at the map. It sort of depersonalizes it. It says, hey, this issue of systemic racism, like maybe you are, like you are not the person who caused this, but we've got a problem that's showing up in our community in terms of pl so some places just having more brownfield sites or, or being inequitable, and now we can solve them together. Great, thank you. I think that I think that flows really nat naturally into uh, Kelly's question. Um, could you give us a few examples of the types of training and support in ED, ED and EJ that your technical assistance can provide? Sure. Thank you for that question. I feel like that was a good setup um, for, for, my, for my little pitch about it. Um, we're at the point in our, in our planning that we're mostly doing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with clients. Um, so you would reach out to us and we would do a little bit to assess, hey, you know, what's, what's going on with your project? Where do you need help in setting environmental justice goals or in, uh, equitable development goals? What's your outreach strategy been to your community and how can we help you to craft an outreach strategy that is going to pull in the diverse and wide array of um, stakeholders um, that you're interested in. We also do sometimes do sub awards to folks who are local to you because you know I'm, I'm sitting here in Boston I might not know what's best for you out in California. Um, so that's where we harness the, the network um, of, of 21 people-centered environmental justice organizations in our network um, and might connect you with folks who can help you a little bit more specifically on um, gosh who are the movers and shakers and players and what is the strategy that you should use to um, talk to your local government about, you know, getting this easement in this way. So, so we really tailor whatever uh, equitable development and environmental justice technical assistance um, you need to, to specifically to you. So yeah, please, please reach out and I'd love to talk more if you are interested. Um, we have about a year left in our, in our pipeline and, and we have room for a couple more folks. Thank you so much. And um, Kelsey's question here is actually addressing a question that I have um, as well. We have a really um, mixed group of attendees at this conference. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how to engage um, other types of brownfield redevelopment practitioners in, in this process. We've talked a lot about engaging the community. I'm mm -hmm. wondering about engaging uh, local attorneys, um, contamination technical experts, as, as Kelsey brought up, um, and other practitioners that are involved in the process in some way, but maybe not so much involved in the community engagement. How do mm -hmm. we bring them into the fold? Absolutely. We find that a lot of the same materials that we use to have conversations with residents are really useful for having conversations with people like city councilors, um, who you often need to get on your side if a project is going to move forward. Uh, in talking to developers who may have a, a, a different view of the project than some of the residents who are gathering together, um, and to some of the technical experts who are tasked with having conversations about really tough 
things related to land use. Why is it that this site is capped and can only be used as, for example, a basketball court as compared to us being able to do a community garden? Um, and and the, the work that we do with, with these experts is to help get everybody on the same page about what those community goals are and what some of the challenges are. Because it would be really hard to, to translate all of that, that technical stuff around here. And, and we are not the technical experts in sort of knowing what you can put where, but we can help uh, technical folks in their translation uh, to residents about how to how to best use these parcels or what the reasonable uses of this parcel are. Because everybody is always weighing that, hey, what's the cost of remediation versus what is reasonable um, from the, the community's perspective. Maybe they don't want a really big capped area. Where, where can we sort of meet, meet folks halfway? So, so part of the work that we do is helping to bridge the gap between uh, those mm -hmm. folks, help them to talk to each other a little bit better, um, and help them to understand the constraints that each one of them are realistically working with. Because the, the ultimate goal, if this is going to be a site that's re actually reused, actually benefits the community, um, folks need to get on the same page pretty early on the process so that they can all stick through it for the long haul. Thank you so much. So um, I guess one question we have um, that follows, that naturally follows to that is how do we raise the visibility of this work and get more people trained and in initiating these conversations and taking actions? Um, I think there are a lot of people that would do that in their professional lives as well as maybe their personal lives, right? Yeah, it's it, one of the things that has been really hard is I'll, I'll answer this question in two ways, like how would we do this in the outside times? Uh, and then how do we do this in the COVID reality when we can't be face to face with people? Because honestly, I have no idea how long this is going to last. So we've had to really um, uh, sort of refigure um, the way that we do a lot of our works work. But generally, um, we found that the visibility of this, this, we've been able to increase the visibility of this type of work by making sure that our graphics are really colorful, they're easy to understand, and that they have descriptive text that helps to walk people through it. A lot of folks have not touched maps since they were, you know, in high school or, or something like that. It may have been a really long time. So making sure that, that folks are able to independently uh, in, engage with those maps, get those online. Uh, GIFs have been really surprisingly powerful. Uh, we, in the, in the before times, we did, uh, you know, sort of, we did door knocking with residents. Um, and sometimes we'd leave them with a stack of those transparencies and ask them, hey, would you talk to your community members and your neighbors, the people in your building, your family, about what we're seeing and, and, and let folks uh, help to train people in the community to be ambassadors for the type of information that you're hoping to get out there. And then, of course, making sure that they have ways to get back in touch with you so that folks can continue to, to be involved. Um, the other way that, that we've uh, found is to, is to get involved with uh, youth as well. We love partnering with high schools and with middle schools. Uh, there's really great overlap between land use redevelopment and civics classes, uh, writing classes. We, we did this one fun engagement uh, where uh, where some folks in the in the, the city were interested in getting uh, youth to start talking to elder residents and understand the history of their community and then for, for students to start to build that future. And the great thing, once you have kids on board, you often have their families on board too to come and have conversations about site reuse and about the work that you're doing. Um, now that we're in sort of the COVID times, a lot of that face-to-face -face door knocking meeting you at the farmer's market, stopping you on your way to the bus stop. Like that's something that we can't do safely anymore with our staff. Um, and so instead we have, we tried a couple of methods. We're using the internet a lot more. We are um, uh, doing flyers and mailing, kind of going like old school community organizing to get information into people's hands. Um, and then finding places where people congregate and sort of asking them at a distance their opinion on things. So, so for example, um, you know, th there's a line that might form outside of the post office standing a respectful, you know, 10 plus feet away from someone, but with a really big poster that shows a site reuse and, and asking them, hey, where do you think we should plant trees in this neighborhood? Or what's an area of concern to you? And having those conversations at a distance, masked um, and meeting people where they are. Yeah, I think it's really important to, to always consider the, the, the times that we're in right now. So thank you for uh, addressing that question in sort of, in sort of two ways. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, education. You mentioned mm -hmm. that um, this really aligns well with students and youth, and I think that's really important. So I want to go back to the topic of GIS. Mm -hmm. And um, there's sort of a two-part question here about um, have you looked at the impact of floods and, and wildfires and how that impacts EJ communities? And second part of that question is how fast can you um, develop some of these GIS maps to reflect those disasters? Can we uh, use those maps um, in an educational context uh, in support of your work? Yeah, um, the uh, we've 
I'll, I'll answer the speed question first, just so that you have a sense of how we build these maps and then we can talk about the utilization and, and how we get them out. Um, generally, the maps can be built really quickly. The United States, like one of the very cool things about our gig in the United States as compared to other people is that we actually have um, access to a tremendous amount of GIS data that is, that is free um, and is publicly available. That is not the case. Like try to build something like this in Canada and you're in, in just sort of a different situation. You're gonna have to pay for some of those data layers. A lot of this stuff is, is free, which is why you can, you know, you can develop partnerships with, with um, places like planning, like planning graduate schools and getting those intro, intro GIS students to go online, find those free data layers and put them together. Real time is a little bit um, more difficult because there's a, a couple of things. One, you know, how, who's collecting, who's collecting that data and, and are they sharing them at the moment? Um, some places like the CAL FIRE website, for example, you can track things in pretty clear real time, but I'm not sure how, how well you're able to get those um, you know, data layers to put into your own GIS work. So that's something that could be a hurdle. Um, another thing that we, we do that is uh, interesting is, is pulling residents and especially youth together to do citizen science and collect information. I, th I think some of the greatest examples of that in Elizabeth, New Jersey and Denver, Colorado, I mean, especially in Richmond, California, uh, where they do air quality monitoring um, and not just in the public sphere, but also getting at data from people's homes. Um, and you can collect that and, and sort of map that to see where are the trouble areas along major commercial corridors that we should be dealing with and where are the areas that are particularly troublesome in people's homes and how should we be thinking about um, the redevelopment or the addition of green infrastructure into those spaces to help people deal with things like wildfires. Flooding is also really interesting because you have things like the FEMA flood maps um, that will show you where uh, flooding is estimated to have happened, but it doesn't always capture things like, oh snap, the sewer drain that's outside my apartment building is like always blocked with trash and my uh, street floods and then my car gets really wet and then this like flows and has, doesn't always capture that information. So we do do a lot of citizen science work with residents to capture what they're seeing um, to make sure that the, that data is accurate. And, and that's usually a pretty fast turnaround time. When we add a new city uh, to our GIS work, it usually takes about a day to build the base maps that, that do things like looking at land surface temperature and tree canopy cover and impervious pavement. So it's not particularly huge or expensive to do. It's something that I think is accessible for a lot of organizations. Um, and then of course, takes a little bit more time to get that citizen science work. Uh, and, and we love connecting with youth in a variety of ways. A lot of our trusts have green teams, which are high schoolers, um, who are able to serve as community ambassadors to, to educate themselves around what they're seeing on these maps about the ecological impacts in their community and then take that out to their church groups and to their um, families and to their cultural organizations uh, and, and spread that information around. Like, did that, I feel like I went to a lot of different places, but that was a big question. Did, did that get closed? Was there, I feel like there's a section I missed. No, I, I, that that was good. I mean, I think I understand that you know when you're when you're looking at real time data, it does get complicated because you know it's not an existing uh, it's not an existing shape file at mm -hmm. that point in a database yeah. somewhere. It's really um, you know it's it's changing quickly. The numbers need to be uploaded. The data needs to be cleaned, which is a pretty um, pretty intense long process. So yeah, yeah I, I understand what you're saying uh, what you're saying there. So the other thing that I want to um, explore quickly, we have a few minutes left is um, when you're exploring the other options for a site's reuse, what else besides trees should we be discussing with stakeholders? Um, just, you know, because I agree with you, it's great to plant some trees, but uh, they cast a pretty small shadow starting out. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah. Um, I, I think that there, there's kind of two ways to look at it. One is um, it's important to really build the capacity of residents to understand all of the different things that are possible. Um, and then that really tricky thing of how much is it going to cost and, and, and how much is it, how much effort is it going to be to maintain. Um, urban trees are awesome, but they do have an average lifespan of about six years. And Arborists are expensive. Like if you're looking, if you folks out there are looking for a side hustle, like check out the arborist gig because they get paid pretty well for, for their, for their um, long build expertise, but it can be really expensive for a city to maintain the health of those trees. Um, so we also look with residents to build their understanding of, gosh, when we're, you know, rebuilding some sort of uh, a building on this property, if the heat vulnerability index, I think you saw in that map um, that I showed you of that large brownfield parcel, there was about half of it that was overlaid with a pretty dark red heat vulnerability index. So residents living near that part of the brownfield parcel, it's really hot and they're very low income. You know, can we do white roofs on that to help reduce the amount of uh, heat that's absorbed into that building? Um, can we paint the asphalt and parking lot areas to help reflect, you know, some heat that can be really difficult near residential areas. And I don't recommend it because then like, 
like the sun's blinding as you're trying to get into your house. Um, but what else can we think about in terms of the landscaping around the property? Um, something that I was very surprised to learn, and this full credit to Jeremy Hoffman uh, from the Science Museum of Richmond, who does a lot of really brilliant heat island work. If you don't know him, look up Jeremy Hoffman and Vivek Shandas. They're, they're wonderful people. Um, grass. Grass around the site uh, can be just as hot in terms of land surface temperature as asphalt. Um, so you should consider different types of ground covering there that are going to help to reduce um, the, the urban heat island effect in that area. So, th so things that are drought tolerant, but that will um, look sort of similar to grass and be low maintenance, things like creeping time. So reviewing the, the varieties of ways in which people might be suffering from the climate crisis uh, and, and help to educate them on the full range of opportunities and then have them prioritize the ones that, that mean the most to them. Maybe they don't want that white parking lot because it's going to blind them to death, but maybe they're really open to creeping time being put on the edge of the parcel so that it, uh, it helps to, to cool the, the, the street temperature. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's, that's really interesting. And so then this last question, just a way to uh, cap things off, what are your next steps with this project? Made a lot of progress, but what are the next yeah, steps? Yeah, absolutely. So for our Climate Safe Neighborhoods Initiative, we are... Um, We've expanded, we've expanded um, the number of cities in our partnership from, uh, from five to nine have, have participated now. And uh, in the cities that we've been working with over the last few years, our next step is to help demystify the policy process so that folks understand how to hold people accountable. So why do you have a mayor and a city councilor and who gets to make these rules? And who's that person in the planning office that's supposed to handle this budgetary process? And who does that work go to if that person you know, quits or gets a promotion? Um, so helping to, to um, demystify what the policy processes look like so that people can hold uh, folks accountable. Um, and then we're also really focusing on helping to alleviate the urban heat island and flooding impacts in neighborhoods that are suffering because this triple threat of the climate crisis, the faltering economy, and COVID-19 is really challenging for these communities. Um, and then for the uh, our K-7 work and the technical assistance work that we do. We do have another year of funding. We are working with clients, you know, from Los Angeles to, um, you know, to Michigan, to Virginia. Um, and we are going to be working through September of 2021. And we actually have just submitted, so fingers crossed, we'll, we'll be able to continue the work if we get an up of our K-7 grant, uh, sorry, of our technical assistance grant um, from the EPA. So fingers crossed, we'll be able to go a couple of years, but that's, that's sort of where we are on both of these. Well, thank you so, so much, Kate. I think this was a really fantastic conversation. And I think moving towards um, policy and holding people accountable to, to the community's needs is a really critical next step. So uh, I'm really uh, excited to see where this project goes from here um, and look forward to uh, keeping tabs on that. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you want to continue the conversation, you're uh, feel free to use the Whova application. I know it's been a little slow today. I apologize for that. Um, please feel free to reach out to Kate personally. She's a very accessible person. <laughs> um, so uh, we really appreciate your attention and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, Kate. You just put your email in the chat. Be sure to grab that and uh, we will see you for the rest of the sessions. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.